So we will be talking about masonry shear walls by the allowable stress design. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I was the chair of the 2016 code committee that actually produced a masonry code that had three fewer pages than the previous edition. So I don't know if that was the only structural code to have fewer pages than its previous edition, but certainly one of the few. The second thing I accomplished as chair was I actually um, was able to uh, get us to go to a six-year cycle. And um, that's uh, the next code will be the 2022 edition. We will have the 2022 are going to a six-year cycle for the Masonry Code. Uh, just also a little um, thing about the the uh, code name. We have been the Masonry Standards Joint Committee, a joint committee with ACI, ASC, and TMS, the Masonry Society, and, and published it under that ACI 530 and so forth. Um, ACI and ASC have graciously relinquished their rights to it, so have recognized recognizing the maturity of the Masonry Society. So 2016 on, it'll be just uh, the TMS 402 code, and that's sort of how I will be referring to it. So just a um, little outline. I'm going to talk briefly about some changes in the 2013 code, particularly as the, how they affect shear walls, a little bit on shear wall types, a brief review of allowable stress design. Really, the crux of this uh, webinar here will be design of walls, both with a um, um, single layer of reinforcement and also with multiple layers of distributed reinforcements. Uh, we'll talk some about special reinforced shear walls, flange walls, and in the 2016 edition of the Masonry Co., we also added in shear friction provisions. I'll talk some about that. I'm hoping during this um, webinar to actually show you two very, what I consider, pretty um, easy ways to des determine the amount of reinforcement required, the amount of flexural reinforcement required for both uh, single layer and also distributed reinforcement um, that will, I think, are pretty good design methods. So that's my goal in this webinar is to provide you with some tools for uh, determining the reinforcement of shear walls that are both pretty easy to use and um, um, result in um, uh, efficient use of the reinforcing. So we'll start with changes in the 2013 code. The three big changes are reorganization, partially grouted shear wall factor, and the unit strength table. So going from 2011 to 2013, we did do reorganization, not in the sense that ACI um, um, did it uh, in blowing up ACI 318. Actually, all of these first seven chapters in 2013 used to be Chapter 1 in the 2011 codes. So chapter 1 just was growing and growing and growing, so we split it apart into seven different chapters. Then we have our engineer design methods. Of course, we're focusing on Chapter 8, allowable stress design, our prescriptive design methods, then some references and appendices here. Um, Really, in a sense, if you're used to 2011, of course, uh, ASD was in Chapter 2. And if you just replace 2 by 8, essentially, then everything remains roughly the same in allowable stress design. Perhaps the biggest change that affected, affects shear walls is that we introduced this partially grouted shear wall factor, gamma sub G. Um, the deal is this, when we went to 2011, I'm sorry, 2008 to 2011 um, masonry code, uh, we eliminated the one-third stress increase. When we eliminated that, we also took a close look at all allowable stresses and did some recalibration. We changed um, allowable stress design shear stresses, huge change. Now, basically, they're the same. It's the same method as strength design. Now, there was some work done at Washington State under Dave McLean, which showed that our strength design provisions for shear walls, the shear in shear walls, was um, the best compared to about seven or eight other codes, Australian, Canadian, New Zealand, several other methods, et cetera. So we um, now have allowable stress design is very similar to strength design for the shear strength of shear walls. We just write in in terms of stress instead of load or like nominal uh, capacity or design capacity, and we use a factor of safety of two. 
Turns out our equations worked really well for fully grouted shear walls, and this is actually the work that was done at Washington State. Um, uh, for fully grouted walls, then they examined about 58 walls. The experimental strength was about 16% greater than the nominal strength. In other words, if you build a wall in the lab and um, um, calculate the capacity according to our strength design provisions and tested it on the average, it would come out about 16% stronger.